First question. At Portland Borstal, you had to do pounding, and what did that involve? When you was down at punishment cells, part of your punishment was pounding. It was the most evil, torturous punishment you could ever think of. You stood up, and in front of you, you had a, a thing on the top, an iron, like a round thing, with a long iron pole down into an iron thing at the bottom where there was Portland stone. You had to all day long. Standing up when you're doing it. And you was in all cubicles. Not much, about as wide as this chair. And a prison officer, or bolster officer, he stood a few paces in his sentry box. So if it rained, he was okay. And he was there watching you all the time, two of them most probably. You, all the time, boom, boom. And at the end of the day, you packed up for lunch. When I say lunch, all that meant is you just went in and had another lump of bread and because she was on bread and water. And at the end of the day, half past four, something like that, four to five, they would come with a scoop and get all the dust out and put it through a sieve. And if you hadn't powdered it like powder and it never went through, then you had to fill the box up to a certain level that had a mark around it. If you hadn't done that, so you were kept down there much longer until you started doing it better. It was the most evil form of punishment you could ever wish to imagine. Your arms were... It, it sounds simple, but honestly, I can't emphasise how much, how tough it was. Okay. Um, you had the birch, I believe it was in, in Maidstone, and, and what was that like? What did that involve, the birch? Well, the birch was, you went over a barrel. May I stand up? Mm -hmm. Went over a barrel, and your wrists ran cut to your ankles, with your bare bums sticking up. And they really made a thing of it. You then could get the birch and the cat for robbery with violence. But if you got it for that, they wasn't too vindictive in giving it to you, as it didn't concern them. Don't get me wrong, they still done it. But for gross personal violence to a prison officer, they really give it all they could. The strongest prison officer in the, or in, in the prison. Okay. I had it twice at Ballstall. Once, when I attacked an officer at Rochester Ballstall, I had it at Maidstone Prison, and the other time at Portland Ballstall, when I attacked a prison officer and got at, that at Dorchester Prison. I always had 18 strokes. I hated odd numbers. Um, uh, in, in Shrewsbury Prison, uh, you got the cat. So what was the, tell us about the cat. I attacked the governor of Shrewsbury Prison in 1945, and I couldn't have the cat at Shrewsbury because the workshop there, the ceiling in the workshop wasn't high enough to put the machine up that you had it on. And I was transferred to Liverpool Prison and had it in the laundry there. They made, when you got corporal punishment, they made a big thing of it to wear you down. You always got it after breakfast or after dinner when all the prison was locked up. And about eight o'clock in the morning, your dear, all their heavy odd now boots on the stone flags. Unlock Fraser! Be a false alarm. Because they knew you, you knew you'd get it after breakfast or after dinner. And you could wait up to 14 days from the time the visiting magistrate sentenced you until you got it. You could wait up to 14 days and they played my games with you. Fortunately for me, I know all about this anyway. Then all of a sudden, on about the 12th, 13th day, the door be open, right? 
then you'd be marched along, pushed along, nearly always in the laundry of the prison you would have. And they really went to town. Well, I was lucky there, by the way, when I first had the cat in September 1945, not long before I had it, shut like that, and it wrapped right round, and when he pulled it off, he pulled a man's nipples off with it. But lucky for me, by then, you had leather here. But not long before me. So I've still got me tits. <laughs> We're moving on to um, prison governors. Now, I believe that you attacked something like eight prison governors, uh, and you did the governor's Shrewsbury, I think, that you just said there. Um, did you also do the, the Leicester governor twice, was it? I attacked two governors at Leicester. Right. One called Clay, he called him Cassius before Mohammed changed his name, and the other Steinhausen. By now I was an expert at prison governors. I knew some didn't mind a good punch, so they could walk around the prison with half a dozen stitches under their eye, didn't frighten me. So they'd come in the bucket brigade. I'd do them with buckets full of shit and piss and ram it over their heads and all you'd see is little turds. Cassius come in that brigade. Steinhausen, he dreaded a punch. And oh, done him lovely, yeah. But I did say to all the fellow prisoners, the train robbers who were there, told them what I was going to do. They were smashing fellas. They said, we'll make one, Frank. I said, no, but that's my coup and don't get involved. But they were terrific. They were good. Now, um, I think you did the Governor of Exeter in revenge for um, something with Jack the Hat and McVitie. What was that about? Well, Jack the Hat at Exeter in 1959, September, was a really lovely guy. And he had a fair fight on the exercise yard with this prison officer. No one else interfered. We made a ring round them. And the other prison officers were ringing the alarm bells. And in no time, about 30 prison officers come out with the chief. By that time, Jack had knocked the prison officer down, a fair fight, said, have you had enough? He said, yes. That was the end of it. Out come the chief officer with a first, what's going on? So I told him what I've just said. And he looks at the prison officer, he said, oh, was it a fair fight? He never answered. In prison terms, that actually meant it was, because it hadn't have been, he'd have soon said it. I said, what do you want to happen, Jack? He said, well, make sure they don't bash me up when I go in, Frank. I've had a fair fight. I said to the chief, you heard what he said? Fair fight, he said, I'll give you my word, Fraser. We won't lay a glove on him. That'd be the end of it. I said, what do you think, Jack? He said, that's good enough, Frank. I'll go in. And as he's going in, Tony Adams, Arsenal's captain, his wife, this divorced from her now, well, Jimmy Andrews, that's his wife's father, shouted out, he was doing seven years like me, shouted to the chief, and if you lay a fucking glove on him, you bastard, we'll knock you and the governor out tomorrow. You couldn't talk like that to him then. Chief said, no, no, Andrews, nothing like that will happen. But of course, as soon as they got Jack in, they bashed him up. If Jim hadn't have said that, they may not have done. So we did knock the governor chief out the next day. Uh, got sentenced to another 18 strokes and 400 days lost of remission in bread and water. Good fun, though. Now, obviously, there's the famous uh, story about um, Governor Lawton. If you could tell us about your relationship with him and what happened with him. Uh, well, this is awkward, really. Can I can't show yeah, you? Yeah, 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 we'd like to. Well, in 1947, prisoners were doing foolish things. I was one of them. But you didn't think it was foolish. Before you'd attacked an officer or something, you'd cut your wrists. It's a sort of thing. They had 80 stitches in each arm. You can still see them now. It's 1947. Plain as anything. 50. Oh, five years ago or so. And I managed to get a little bit of blade, cut it. And when the governor come round, as he had to, every day, more or less a formality, 
Those governors just walked by, all right, straight on. But he come right in the cell. I jumped on him, bashed him up, smothered him in blood. And when they stitched me up with 80 stitches, they put me in a straitjacket. The straitjackets then come in three sizes, small, medium and large. They should have put me in small, but he put me in large. And at the back, put all wet blankets and pillows down there. The hospital at Pentonville had been bombed in the war. It still hadn't been repaired. So they were using B2 landing as a makeshift hospital. No padded cell, but they move all the furniture out of the cell, called furniture, the odd thing, and put brand new mattresses on the floor. <coughs> For the first two days, the mattresses were quite good. You actually sunk in them. After that, it was like lying on concrete. And like an idiot, I was young, 24, 25, somehow I'd get up and walk up and down the cell. And by doing it, I realised I'd snapped a couple of stitches so I could feel the blood. And then I couldn't lie on my back, because I'm like Humpty Dumpty with all this wet blankets. So I'd roll over onto my stomach, and I realised I'm going to suffocate, because me mouth is going right into the mattresses where I'm sinking into them. And as the night wore on, I'm having a tremendous struggle to roll over on my back. I'm on bread and water and all. And the governor, they had it like a hospital cell door where they cut out a thing and he could open the thing and look through bars. And heard him say about seven in the evening. You had no idea at the time, but you had to sort of guess how it was. He's still alive, won't be long now, he'll soon be dead. I knew if I could last out till seven in the morning, I'd be okay. Because fresh prison officers come on and have to take me out of the straitjacket and give me a drop of water. And all night he kept coming. He's still alive. I survived. Till the next morning. I had more stitches in. And in November 1951, I was now free, he was now Governor of Wandsworth, he had been promoted, that was the top prison in the country then, 51 November. I kidnapped him and his dog and hung up on Wandsworth Prison. Now I love dogs, who don't? Everyone does. But I thought, Frank, you'll have to get rid of him, because it might be your luck, he'd be the first dog that could talk and say, man, Frankie done it. So the dog went, but one, I wasn't strong enough or tall enough to reach a higher branch, and Lawton's toes managed to touch the ground. He survived. Twelve months later, I'm back in Wandsworth, because while I'm hanging him, I'm going, my turn now. Twelve months later, I'm back in Wandsworth. He couldn't get down the cells quick enough to go, my turn now. That's when I got the cat over him. You acted mad at one point, and you, you were certified as saying, well, what happened? Well, I had been certified insane in the army during the war. And this guy said to me, Charlie Waters, he said, Frank, you get, keep getting in trouble, so why don't you act a bit mad and get to Broadmoor? It's terrific. I said, leave or Charlie, I couldn't do it, because then you had to be raving mad in prison. He said, your certainty, Frank, the screws are frightened of you. I said, leave or Charlie, about as fat as a matchstick. You know, he said, I'm telling you. He put the idea in my head. And I thought, well, I'll go for it. And I made out the prison officers were slinging rats in my cell. But now they're my, my friends. And I tapped a couple of officers and I'm in the strong cell. On H1 landing, there's two ferocious cells. You have to walk through about three to get to them. And when the visiting magistrates come to certify me, because then you had to be certified be the magistrates and a doctor, not now, just two doctors. And they come and the prison officer said, Fraser, busy magistrates, will you tell them about your friends, the rats? I come bounding up to them. I said, well, some of them are friends of mine and some of them are enemies. Are you one? And leapt to them. They went, oh, we've seen enough. They couldn't sign the form quick enough. I'm back to Broadmoor. It was great fun. What's what about the guy at Broadmoor? What was that? He stood all day long like this. Yeah. Oh, yes! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he went... 
all day long like this, he stood. So I made inquiries about him. They said, Frank, he's been here 22 years. He thinks he's an electric light bulb. Bored to tears, it was in block six. They had different names now, that was like the punishment block. And I crept behind him, I said, I pulled your plug out. He went, swish me back on, swish me. The broader officer shouted out, Fraser, Fraser, put his plug back. So I said, I'll put your plug back. He went, oh, so you could have some good laughs. Well, what kind of treatment did you have, though, uh, there? Was it like electric shock treatment or something? Well, I was dead lucky there. A guy who had been the broad war, he said, if you ever go there, Frank, you're going block six, the punishment block. And when you arrive, they'll give you the sleeper. You won't notice it being a food or something the day you arrive. And you'll be like a baby, like that. But if you cause trouble when you arrive like that, they'll give you this, the, the other one that's worse. That's the shitter. And you, you literally your guts come out all day long. And in a month you're dead. He said, the chief officer will come in your cell when you arrive the next day. So what's your name? You tell him. Do you know where you are? Yes. Where? Broadmoor. He will then say to you, well at Broadmoor we can do things that they can't do in prison. Do you understand what I mean? He knows there's nothing wrong with you. He's letting you know. And you just say yes. Because by then you've realised you've had the mould that one out of the two, the sleeper. And he was dead right, Jack, the guy who told me. Spot on. That's exactly what happened. When I attacked and kidnapped the governor of Wandsworth Prison, Lawton, in November 1951, I knew his routine it was common knowledge. I'd found that out where he exercised his dog on the common any time from six o'clock or till half past seven, something like that, when it's getting dark and everything. And I waited for him. And must remember, I was only about 28 then, 27, and very fit. Not much of me, but very strong for me, size. Leapt at him, bash, bomb, and hung him. It was a great night, simple as that. Sounds easy as I say it, but obviously it wasn't that easy. He did put up some sort of a struggle, but not good enough. I was much too powerful and determined for him. It was a wonderful night, but I failed, unfortunately. He survived. The best bit of luck I had, my pal Jack, who had been to Broadmoor, he told me the routine. The people like me and him, they knew by sending you to Broadmoor, it was a sweet way to get you out of the prison system and let Broadmoor put up with you. And he told me what the routine was. When you went there, they knew you wasn't mad or anything like that. It was just a sweet way to get you out of the prison system. And the chief officer of Broadmoor, he will come in your cell, what you could call some sort of a cell, Broadmoor, the very morning after you arrived the night or afternoon before. And he'd say, what's your name? You tell him. And he'd say, do you know where you are? You tell him, Broadmoor. He then says, at Broadmoor, we can do things that they can't do in prison. Do you understand what I mean? And you know right away, because you know you're like that. You've got no strength or nothing, and you realise they've slipped something in the food you've had, or water or tea or whatever, or medicine. And he knows that you most probably know that you've had the mild treatment. And if you get abusive or saucy to him, the next one will be the killer, the shitter, where all your stomach, your guts just drain away inside six weeks you're dead. And remember, they could do things then, 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago, 
that they couldn't do today. Who cared then if you died? There'd be an inquest, natural causes, be the end of it. That was the best bit of luck and advice I've ever had, because that's exactly what happened. This was something in 1947 that young prisoners were doing. He thought it upset the prison authorities. Like an idiot, I was no different. I managed to get a bit of razor and cut me to pieces, but with mine, there was a method in it. I knew that when the governor come round, as he had to, every day as part of the customary duty, but he was the governor who come right in your cell. And I jumped on him and smothered him with blood and gave him a few punches and all. Well, I had 80 stitches in each arm. 1947, you can see even now, it was plain as anything. Just retell us about the penalty. It was the most cruelest punishment ever. Absolutely. You had like a, imagine a bar of iron, about, about that diameter, going all the way down into a round pod, strong all iron, with a, the Portland rock in it, and you'd be all day long. In all weather, rain, snow or whatever. And at the end, the prison officers would come and they would have a sieve and it'd have to go through into a box. And that box had to be full up. And if it wasn't, you was kept down there longer on what is known as PCFO, penal class, until further orders. And the reason you'd be told, because you hadn't been filling the box up every day. Uh, and, and maybe we can recap a bit about the, the cat. The cat and I tells. Strangely enough, out of the two, the birch was the worst. <laughs> Only because the birch, you never see it, or the cat. It's always behind you, but you've no idea what it's like. The birch be seven sort of twigs, and a prison officer could really get a swirl on it. Stroke one, Shh. Same thing with a cat, Francis Davidson Fraser. You've been sentenced to corporal punishment. In your case, 18 strokes of the cat. That sentence has now been confirmed be the Secretary of State, the Home Secretary. And that punishment will now commence. Stroke one! Well, the cat is seven lumps of light leather. So really, he can't get the same momentum as he can with the twigs. So, uh, and also, you get it across your rocks and boulders, your shoulders here sort of style, where your skin is more tougher, thicker, so you can absorb it better. Whereas the birch goes across your deaf and dumb, your bum, which is very tender. Yeah, I thought the birch was worse. Well, oh, yes, tell us about the, the, the bucket of uh, shit for uh, the governors. Well, I, I was an expert at doing prison governors. Some, they didn't mind a good punch. They could parade it, didn't frighten me. So I'd do them with buckets of shit and piss, where I'd deliberately go to the doctor and sound constipated. Well, they couldn't give you a mixture and make an elephant go, yet alone a human being. So the time the governor come round the next day, the bucket will be full up right to the top. So I'd have a proper bucket, not just the ordinary piss pot they give you, but a bucket where as if you're gonna clean your cell out with. Full to the top and ram it right over his head. Bosh! All you'd see is just little turds. And when I was in front of the governor, for instance, in front of the visiting magistrates at Lincoln Prison, when I'd done the governor there, his name was Clay, that one. And they, anything to say, Fraser? I said, well, the only thing I can remember, when they got the bucket off his head and wiped his mouth, he said, You've ruined me, Fraser. 
You rule me. For the rest of my career, I shall be known as Ship Pop Pa. He never said that. His name was Pa, not Clay. He never said a word, actually. I just said that. Even the magistrates were... Stop themselves laughing, yeah. And that's what he's known with the rest of his career. Ship Pop Pa.